live talks tonight. Um, my, name is, my name is Miranda Patterson, and I am the cultural attache here at the U.S. Embassy. And I am excited to be here with um, Frau Brickner, who is a journalist with Der Standard here in Austria, as well as Professor Nikki Brown, who is a distinguished professor in the University of Kentucky, who is going to be talking to us this evening about African-American and political engagement um, in the United States, um, and which as we know is a, is a very hot topic right now, not only in the United States, but also in Austria. And um, we're excited that we can have this discussion this evening. Um, as I mentioned, this is the first in a mini series of various programs we at the US Embassy in Austria have um, going on right now. Um, so on February 23rd, we will have another um, exciting um, conversation um, with another professor and we will be talking about um, social movements and youth involvement. And we will be doing that um, in partnership with Muslim Youth Austria. So be sure to tune in for that. Please stay um, abreast on everything we have going on by following us on our various social media accounts. Um, um, USEMB Vienna um, is our main Instagram account as well as Facebook and you can find it all there. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to pass it over to Frau Brickner, who is going to give a more in-depth introduction of our guest speaker. Thank you all. Thank you very much, Miranda. Yes, uh, hello from my side. Um, yes, I was presented already. My name is Irene Brickner. I'm a journalist and managing editor for the daily newspaper and online paper Der Standard in Vienna. Um, in my journalistic work, I mostly concentrate on matters of human rights, of asylum and equality. At the moment, I more uh, concentrate on matters of the corona pandemic, but I think the journalists all over the world are in the same situation right now. Um, to begin, I want to introduce Professor Nikki Brown. She's an expert uh, on African-American um, history, African-American women, film, visual studies, and photography. Uh, she has been teaching American and African-American history since 1999. And her major themes are gender, race, identity, representation, and politics. Um, she has written a book about private politics and public voices, Black women's activism from World War I to the New Deal, uh, published at Indiana University Press, and has won the Letitia Woods Brown Award for Best Book uh, in African American Women's History in the year 2006. Um, she's also a professional photographer. And yesterday evening, I spent watching with a great interest a video in which she presented her photos from Turkey, where she travels once a year in normal, not pandemic times, for an oral history project about the Afro-Turks, which are the East African descendants of slaves in the Ottoman Empire. It's a very interesting thing. I can recommend this. It's on the homepage of the Kentucky University. Um, but today, uh, Professor Brown will speak about another topic, the role of the African-American voters, which was central yet crucial at the presidential elections in the USA in last fall. Why? Because, for example, in 2020, African-American voters represented 30 million people, and one third of them were living in the most uh, competitive US states like Arizona, Florida, Ohio, and Wisconsin. Um, uh, we will have now a very interesting um, um, And I ask uh, Nikki to start with it. Thank you. We don't hear you. you uh, have to right. Woo. I'm glad I got that out of the way. Good gracious. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Frau Brickner, and thank you, Ms. Patterson. Um, uh, let's jump right in. And let's talk about the way African Americans, uh, the perception of African American voting throughout the 20th century. There, there, is, a, there is a belief that in, in the United States that uh, because the United States is so multiracial and multi-ethnic, there's a belief that like specific ethnic groups vote for candidates of the same identity. 
So that for much of the 20th century, it, the belief was that African Americans would vote for African American candidates, or that Irish Americans would vote for Irish American candidates, or gay voters would vote for gay candidates. And that's the conventional wisdom, that people vote according to their identity, and only their identity. The problem with this conventional wisdom is that it's not true for African Americans. Uh, and that is because there is a long history of racism uh, and a racial caste system in the, in the United States that makes American politics very complex and, and also very fascinating. So the history of slavery denied African Americans the right to vote for something like 300 years. And then the Civil War, the American Civil War, which ended in 1865, uh, uh, helped to guarantee the right to vote for African Americans, and for and for about 30 years between 1865 and 1895, maybe 1900, uh, African Americans did have that, uh, access to voting. But then the vote is denied again through through laws, through state laws, uh, that that uh, in particularly in southern states, so so African Americans have their vote taken away between 1900 and 1965. So, so this is this this quick guide doesn't really tell us the story of African American voter participation. So, if there's one specific area that I would like to focus on before getting to the big topic, it would be uh, the 1930s. Uh, before the 1930s, African Americans, if they voted, voted for the Republican Party, which is conceived, which is seen as the conservative party. Uh, and that is because the Republican Party is associated with Abraham Lincoln and, uh, and, and uh, the period after Abraham Lincoln. But in the 1930s, uh, with the, the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt and the New Deal administration, African Americans switched their party loyalty to, uh, from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party. And even when even when the Democratic Party didn't fully support African American civil rights movement and voting rights, African Americans still voted uh, for uh, the Democratic Party or didn't vote at all. So from the, the 1930s till now, African Americans are the most loyal members of the Democratic Party. And so, uh, and so that brings us to uh, the year 2020. What I'm going to do is share my screen, and I have a um, a PowerPoint, uh, and the PowerPoint looks looks exciting. It looks exciting because there's a lot of information in it. But what I want to say is that I, I prepared this PowerPoint for anyone uh, who wants to uh, contact me or or wants to see more about this. I so it's got a lot of information in it, but I'm not going to go over every detail. I'm just saying if you want to start looking at African-American voter participation. There are a lot of interesting links uh, in this PowerPoint. So, so let's look at this. Let's start, let's start with the year 2020. And let's go to the election of 2020. And this slide right here shows us that there are about uh, 48 million African-Americans right now who are about 15%, 14.6% of the American population. And what makes 2020 very, very important is that African Americans turned out in huge numbers for Joe Biden and the presidential election, and they also uh, uh, they also turned the state of Georgia. So what we have here, I'm just going to isolate it, is this: when I say that African Americans are the most loyal, the most loyal uh, members of the Democratic Party, you know, if we isolate it, I'm going to say this. African Americans are 80, 84% of African American voters are registered Democrats. If I go back, if I go back here, uh, uh, excuse me, if I go back here, we can see this number, 51% of whites and 63% of Hispanics or Latinx communities. So, so by far, the most loyal ethnic group to the Democratic Party, uh, which is the left-leaning, or center left party is African American, and and uh, and we don't see that le that level of loyalty with with any other group. So, in order to focus on 
African American voter participation and the 2020 presidential election, I have isolated or I've identified like three people that I think uh, were critically important. And, uh, and I would say that these people swayed the election. These people were able to turn the election for Joe Biden. Uh, and uh, with, if you take any one of these three people out of the equation, uh, Joe Biden loses. That's how important they are. And so, and, and, uh, and so you, take, you take them out of the equation, Donald Trump is president again. And the Republican Party is in control of all three branches of government. You take these three people out, and that's what your out, that's what your outcome is. So let's talk about these three people. The three people are uh, James Clyburn, Stacey Abrams, and the African American voters of Georgia. There are many people that we could talk about. We could talk about Barack Obama and Michelle Obama. We could talk about historical figures like Shirley Chisholm. We could talk about huge donors like Oprah Winfrey or, or, or long-term members, civil rights activists like Jesse Jackson and Fannie Lou Hamer or the first black woman senator, uh, Carol Mosley Brown. But I wanted to focus on three people, James Clyburn, Stacey Abrams, and, and the black voters of Georgia because each of them uh, played this critical role. So let's start. Let's start with James Clyburn. Um, if we think back a year ago, like a year ago, 2020, right now, remember Joe Biden was losing. He was losing the Fed, uh, the, the Democratic part primary. Uh, he, um, he, there, there were three major uh, uh, primary elections at, right uh, in the United States a year ago. And, and the primary election is basically that um, the, the, Demo the, the opposing party holds all these different elections to see who is the most popular candidate. And each state has a primary. And the person who wins the most elections becomes the candidate that's going to oppose the incumbent. So the incumbent is Donald Trump. And there are all these different candidates that were running at that time to try to be the next president, to try to be the Democratic candidate and unseat Donald Trump. Joe Biden was losing. Just That's the most important point. Last year, uh, he lost something called the Iowa caucuses. He came in fourth in the Iowa caucuses. He came in fifth in the New Hampshire primary. He came in second, a distant second, to Bernie Sanders in the Nevada caucuses. Uh, Joe Biden's campaign was in bad shape. People just didn't think that Joe Biden was going to win. And so the next big state after the Nevada caucuses is South Carolina. And the most popular politician in South Carolina is James Clyburn. Lindsey Graham is from South Carolina. There are other folks from South Carolina. The most important one is James Clyburn. James Clyburn is uh, uh, what I think he, he's, he is a longtime running senator from South Carolina. He is, uh, he's serving his 15th term. He is 80 years old. He's been in Congress since 1993. He is a former civil rights activist. And I liked, I'm happy to say, a former history major at South Carolina State University. And he is what we call a, pink, a kingmaker. So you can't get anywhere in, in uh, South Carolina politics without getting James Clyburn's endorsement. So Joe Biden comes into South Carolina in February and asks for James Clyburn's endorsement and James Clyburn gives it and has this quote. He says, he says, James Clyburn says, I gave George, uh, uh, I gave Joe Biden my endorsement because it isn't about me. It ain't about me. It's about my children. It's about my grandchildren and all others who are similarly situated. It's all about the future. And Joe Biden, and then, and then what happens is that Joe Biden wins South Carolina handily. And in fact, he wins, it, he wins it so big that he calls uh, uh, James Clyburn a week later and says, I would never be in this position if you had not give me, given me your endorsement. The next week after the South Carolina uh, uh, primary in which Joe Biden wins big, 
uh, we call that the next week is called Super Tuesday, in which uh, 16 states vote for their Democratic candidate. And Joe Biden won uh, nine of those 16 states. And he is able to break free from the pack and become the Democratic candidate. He would not have been able to do that without the support of James Clyburn. Had he lost South Carolina, uh, Joe Biden, uh, he would have lost the presidential race. But there's a, there's a second person. I'm moving on because I, I um, have a, 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 a few minutes left. The second person who is pivotal is uh, Stacey Abrams. Stacey Abrams is associated with voter suppression or, vo or efforts to overtake, over, overcome and reverse voter suppression. She is a lawyer. She is a, a politician, a state representative. She's a voting rights act activist. She is one of five children. Her parents are ministers. She graduated from Spelman College, which is a historically black university, a college in, in Georgia. Uh, but she also graduated with a degree in public affairs from the University of Texas and uh, Yale Law School. For six years, she was a state representative in uh, Georgia. She ran for governor uh, of Georgia in 2018 and lost by a very narrow margin of about 64,000 votes. What she pointed out in her, in her speech, uh, she said that uh, something like 1.5 million people in Georgia had had their vote taken away. So she's saying uh, that she could have won, she may have won, had, had black people not had their vote taken away in Georgia. And so she sets out to stop the suppression of the vote. In the United States, because it's such a complex country and with complex uh, racial identities, um, it's actually fairly, it's actually, you can take uh, an ethnic group's right to vote away as long as you don't use that particular phrase anymore. So we call that voter suppression. You can have, you can lose your right to vote if you move out of state, if you move or you die or, and the voting rolls are purged. You can, the right to vote or uh, voter suppression happens when uh, the, the place to vote, the polling place is moved and you don't tell people. Uh, uh, in Texas, another way that the right to vote is suppressed is, is by changing the laws for acceptable ID. In Texas, you can register to vote using your hunting license, but you cannot register to vote using your college ID. Uh, also very importantly, Election day in the United States is not a national holiday. So people have to work on election day and some people can't take off work to vote. Uh, the most important way or the most critical way that people lose their right to vote in the United States is if they are convicted of a felony. And that affects uh, one out of every 13 African-Americans. I live in the state of Kentucky where one out of every five African Americans has lost their right to vote because of a felony conviction. Doesn't matter how old it is. So Stacey Abrams created this organization called Fair Fight. Uh, uh, Fair Fight, and Fair Fight said that uh, they're going to try to get millions of people uh, registered to vote, and she did. In 2018, uh, towards the end, she registered her organization, 200,000 people. In 2020, she registered another 500,000 people. And that organization is able to get black people to the polls. Polls. You take Stacey Abrams and Fair Fight out of this equation and, and Georgia does, remains a conservative state and, and uh, very likely Donald Trump wins. But my last, my last group is uh, the black voters of Georgia, but also the black voters of, of uh, 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 Milwaukee and Michigan uh, and uh, Wisconsin and Pennsylvania. Georgia is a uh, is a conservative state, uh, and it used to be reliably Republican. But what happens is that Georgia, uh, because of fair fight, it, it it encourages people, black people, to register to vote, and because black people registered to vote and are reliably Democrats, those black people voted for Joe Biden. And as you may have heard, and we can talk about this 
at the at the end, Joe Biden wins the state of Georgia by this tiny margin of 12,000, 12,000 uh, votes. And, and, it's, and he's put over the top by African-Americans. Joe Biden would not have won uh, Georgia without African-American votes. On election day in November, uh, 5 million people cast their vote uh, for, for all groups. 32% of that 5 million were African-Americans. And they all, almost all voted for Joe, for Joe Biden. And so that's how we know what the difference is. Uh, we, uh, there was a runoff election in January 2021, which also featured black voters. There was uh, this is important because this this uh, this uh, uh, the, the the election of uh, Raphael Warnock and Kelly Leffler. Uh, oops, goodness gracious! Uh, oh yeah, that that election uh, uh, produced the first black voter, the first black senator of uh, uh, in Georgia's history. And this election featured the first Jewish center, senator and voters in, in Georgia history. Uh, and and they, they also turned out in huge numbers for, uh, uh, they meaning African-American voters, turned out in huge numbers in support of Raphael Warnock and John Ossoff. And they supported them, because, not because they're Jewish or black, but because they had a progressive agenda. Both of them are advocated for a higher minimum wage universal health care, uh, the Green New Deal, uh, and so forth. And it's those issues that brought people to the, to, to the vote. So, uh, so in conclusion, I would say that it's important to recognize that African-American voter participation has evolved along with the evolution of the United States voting system. And that African-Americans uh, are more likely to vote on policy issues rather than their identity issues. And African-Americans supported Bernie Sanders and African-Americans supported Elizabeth Warren, but African-American voters are incredibly pragmatic. And when it comes to candidates like Bernie Sanders or Elizabeth Warren, African-Americans just, just, just decide, as a voting group said that 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 uh, those two just weren't going to win against Donald Trump. Uh, that's that's the hard that's the hard news. That Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren were likely not going to win, but Joe Biden was going was had a very good chance to win, and in fact he did win by a very by in in places like Georgia by a slim margin, but he but he he in fact did win. So that's where I'm going to end uh, this particular presentation. But, but that just opens up the rest of the conversation this hour to have some questions about uh, African-Americans and, and other issues that, that are important in the year 2020. So I wanna thank you very much and I'm gonna stop the share and here I am again. And so, yes, yes, uh, thank you so much again. And I'm gonna hand it over to you, Frau Brickner. Oh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation um, what I forgot to, 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 to tell is that everybody who uh, takes part in this discussion can ask questions by the Slido uh, the, the, the thing that somebody everybody should have uh, to, 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 to free to use um, what I wanted to ask you first is you spoke now about the voter suppression which concerns uh, African Americans more than other groups of the American society mm -hmm. can you please uh, tell me how did this evolves? What are the historical grounds that uh, the water suppression is much stronger against the African Americans than other groups? And how are, for example, Hispanics doing in this in this, in this way? That's true. That's um, Af uh, voter suppression uh, is usually not named by race, meaning it used to be like it used to be in like 1860 or 1850 that the right to vote could be taken away specifically if a person was black. But you can't do that by law. So the right to vote, it was taken away from African-Americans by using other means, uh, starting around 1900. Uh, uh, the right to vote is, uh, is organized by the state, meaning, meaning even though it's a federal law, everybody by the constitution is supposed to have the right to vote. It's the states that actually administer it, that, that, that regulate it. And 
in, in the year 1900 or the year 1920 or 1930, states like Georgia would say to black voters, you, in order to vote, you must prove to us that you can read. And then they would come up with a test that was so difficult that nobody passed it. Or they would say, voter, the, the state of Georgia would say things like, you, if you want to vote, black person, you must pay a tax uh, before you can go into the voting rules. And that tax was not applied to whites or other groups. It was only applied to African-Americans or or uh, very specifically, even now, even now here in the United States, in the year 2020, uh, there is the law of felonies. If you, a uh, felony um, disenfranchisement, which means that if you have uh, the history, a history of being arrested and being convicted of a felony, you lose your right to vote. And that disproportionately affects African-Americans and Latino Americans or, or uh, black and brown people. And so, and that, and that rule or that law is still on the books across many, many states. So, if, so to, to conclude, you don't have to say black people, we're not gonna allow you to vote. You just find different parts of society or culture that affect African-Americans and you apply pressure to those, to those aspects. And then you say, okay, uh, uh, and then those laws are applied so that that's how votes are suppressed. Mm -hmm. I see. Um, how, how high is the percentage of uh, African American voters who were suppressed uh, by their rights to vote in this That's election now? That's a good question. I can only go back historically. Mm -hmm. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, which is in our memory. I am uh, 50 years old. So the Voting Rights Act was passed about six years before I was born. But my parents, who are 80 years old, remember a time when African Americans were not allowed to vote. And so to answer your question, depending on where, where you lived, and many African Americans, like in 1965, lived in the South, depending on where you lived, like in Mississippi or Louisiana or Texas, something like, or Alabama, something like 90% of African Americans were barred from voting. The numbers were that bad. Uh, in the, in a in a uh, I remember in the state of Mississippi in 1960, only seven percent. That's a single digit. Seven uh, was seven percent of African Americans were allowed to register to vote, meaning that 93 percent were not allowed to register to vote. Yeah. Okay, thank you. There's a question now by Slido from somebody anonymous. He asked, the requirement of state-issued photo IDs for voting seems to be a point of contention. Is there any reason that state-issued IDs would be harder or easier to obtain for one race or another? Yes, yes. And uh, some states, like I said, some states don't issue, uh, don't allow, uh, some forms of ID, like in Texas, I said, uh, like that's an example. In Texas, you can have, you, you can use your gun permit, which I think is a photographic, uh, your gun license, but you can't use your college ID, which also is a photo, photo ID. Uh, in many states where, where uh, uh, the, the national, uh, the United States doesn't have a national voter, a national ID system. And across the United States, people usually use their driver's licenses. Uh, but in many states, uh, uh, African Americans usually use don't have driver's licenses, or uh, uh, but but they use public transportation. And so the the driver's license is the most is the most common form. But many but many people who rely on public transportation, African Americans or working people. Uh, don't have driver's licenses. And so that's a way to keep people from, from voting as well. I see. Yes. Okay, uh, there's another question from Joseph. He asks, is there a chance that voter suppression will become even more fierce as demo demographics are changing in a way that disfavors Republicans and uh, their voter base? Yes, yes. There's a great article in the Washington Post 
uh, that ex that laid that out. I, and I and I jumped right ahead to that because yeah, uh, what the Republican Party is doing now is trying to suppress the vote by eliminating something that was critical in the 2020 election, and that is mail-in ballots. Because of the pandemic, people didn't want to stand outside and stand close to each other for hours uh, waiting to vote. So, so many states made it easier for people to mail in their votes. But, uh, uh, but to, to go back to Donald Trump, he was able to convince a huge population of Americans that mail-in voting was fraudulent. And so the Republican Party is running on that. There's no evidence that mail-in voting is fraudulent. But the, but the Republican Party is, is working on people's fears and saying, OK, we're going to try to reduce the number of mail-in vote, voting. Uh, and, 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 the, the, and the real reason they're doing that is to reduce the number of people who uh, are likely to use mail-in voting. And that is uh, black and brown people. Uh, again, because people, because, uh, uh, because election day is not a national holiday. So if you're working on that day, if you are a service worker, if you drive for an Uber, if you work in a cafeteria, if you're a janitor, if you, are, if you work in a hotel, uh, you can't take that day off, but you can vote if you put your ballot, if, if, if you use a mail-in ballot. But the Republican Party is, try, is thinking about different ways to reduce or eliminate mail-in ballots as well and saying you can only vote if you vote in person. Mm -hmm. We had discussions about mail-in ballot in Austria too, because the Freedom Party said uh, this is something unfair, and uh, yes, there's a ways that to corrupt this this this, uh, this way to vote. But mm -hmm. what is really uh, astonishing in the United States, in my opinion, is that the voters of Donald Trump really believe that uh, the, the vote was taken away. Do you have any theory why this is so such a strong impression? Why uh, Trump was able to, to convince so many people about that? That's a, you know that's probably that is a, such a great question, and we're trying to figure this out now. Why is it that people believe that lie? Mm -hmm. I. I. Well, <laughs> I, I suspect that people believe the lie because they don't trust the system. There is a really strong part of, there's a really big part of America right now that, and, and let's be very specific and very clear, uh, uh, nearly all of Donald Trump supporters are white Americans and, of, and a huge percentage are white men. And there's a real fear and anxiety among white people that uh, uh, that the United States is changing and it's changing very quickly. And there's a fear that of the government. There's a there's a historical mistrust of the government. And so many Americans uh, look at something like mail-in voting and they say, well, that's just the government. Uh, uh, behaving in a in a in a mistrustful or distrustful way, or they look at uh, uh, or or when Donald Trump, who who says that he's one of them, he says that he's part of the working class or the populists. He's not, by the way. I mean, he's you know he's not, but he says that he supports working class and and uh, white Americans, and he says that the vote was stolen from them, and they already are mistrustful. And they already think that the system is uh, has uh, sold them out, and they 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 think that other people are getting ahead, and are taking uh, and are and are taking something away from them, and so that I think the combination of that of those factors of of mistrust for the government, uh, anger that other people are getting or the perception that other people are getting ahead and feeling left behind. Yeah, those things have contributed, have worked together to make it so that people think that Donald Trump was 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 really elected, despite all evidence. Um, this is one of those things, I know it's a long answer, this is one of the things that you can't, 
convince people with evidence. You can't. You can show them the evidence, and they're like, "No, no, 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 can't hear it." Uh, so, so we have to find other ways to convince people uh, of the truth. But isn't it a fact that the American society is changing? That the white hegemony is ending, uh, in will end in let's say in the next centuries. Sure, racially, racially, uh, the 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 uh, I forget what the numbers are, but the but the numbers meaning. Uh, Some will say by tw by the year 2050, which is only 30 years away, yeah. uh, by the year 2050, uh, the United States will be uh, a country that is mostly people of color, uh, mostly Latino, or uh, there will be a majority of people who are Latino and African American and Asian American and Native American. Um, so that's that's definitely that's definitely in the mix, absolutely, and that there uh, there is a person in serving in Congress now who. Uh, who got to, her name is Marjorie Taylor Greene. She is a conspiracy theorist. And one of the ways that she has gotten into Congress is by also scaring uh, uh, white people and saying to them that uh, America is changing too fast, that there are too many people of color and uh, America, and, and, and in 30 years, you won't be able to recognize America. So yeah, yeah, that is a fear, but you know, As, as we say, uh, as we say in the historical game, you know, thoughts and feelings are not, not facts. You know, you can feel like somebody has taken your job, but the but what do the facts say? Or you can perceive that somebody's getting ahead of you, uh, but what do the facts say? The facts say something different. Uh, uh, and that's part of this. Uh, that's part of the work that uh, that people are trying to do, trying to convince people that nobody's getting ahead, or you know, nobody's jumping ahead of other people in this line. Uh, or yes, yeah. Okay, Joseph, who asked the question, the last question I was reading, ask another question. Uh, just what the name of the Washington Post article is uh, that you mentioned about the Republicans and the. The, the voter suppression. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna have to go to uh, my internet and and look that up. So if you want to ask uh, another question as I as I look that up, because I'll, I'll put that in the chat, if that's okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm okay. See if I can find it. Uh, okay. So uh, I. Uh huh. Yes. Just ask you another question while you're you're looking. Okay, um, there's another question. Um, are people trying to fight against gerrymandering? Yes, they are. Uh, uh, um, uh, yeah, it is. It is uh, uh, gerrymandering is something that is also uh, uh, go. It goes back quite a long time. It goes back uh, since before I was born. Um, Uh, that uh, and but the, uh, the, the if, if people don't know what gerrymandering is, let me let me turn this off. But people don't know yes, what maybe you're, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, gerrymandering maybe you, you, you. Is, a, um, is a little bit of magic. It's a little bit of political magic. So, and what gerrymandering does is uses magic, political magic to take an area that is predominantly black and, and divide it up in a way so that it has, so that the black voters or the black residents of that area have less power and the white voters have more power. Uh, uh, very specifically, it's a very good question, but this is how it works. Let's say that you are living, let, uh, you, uh, let's, use, let's, use a, let's use an Austrian example. Let's say that you, in Austria, uh, live in Vienna. And let's say that, uh, I'm just gonna pick a number. Let's say that there are a uh, hundred black people living in Vienna. Like the, the population of Vienna is a hundred and, uh, and all of them are black. But in the suburbs of Vienna, the outskirts of Vienna, let's say that there are four suburbs of Vienna And each of those suburbs has 25 white people. So you have 25 in the north, 25 in the east, 25 in the south, 25 in the west. 
the if you were to take the the total population of Vienna, which is a hundred black people, in theory, a hundred black people, uh, there should be a black representative for that for Vienna, uh, a black. Uh, but but what gerrymandering does is says it draws it uses the magic, it draws the political map so that the representative of Vienna is not that one black person, but it's one white person because. In theory, there are a hundred white people who are living on the outskirts of Vienna. So Vienna gets a white representative instead of a black representative, even though there's not a white person living in Vienna. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yes, that's it's how gerrymandering kind of, works. Yeah. Yes? Okay. Yes, yes that's how gerrymandering works. Kind of so the idea again, so so the big idea is this. The big idea is this. You have a city or a region that has a lot of black people, but you don't assign representatives based on that population. You just assign representatives based on the region that has a lot of white people. And it's completely legal. Um, and it's based on uh, it's based on voting patterns. And that that's why it's magic. That's why. It's hard, uh, you know. It's it's one of those things that if you if you know how to do it, if you know how to redraw the political map, you can make that happen. But uh, but if you don't, uh, no. But if you don't know how to do that stuff, it's very very frustrating. So yes, so the Republicans are able to stay in power because they use ger gerrymandering. Well, both sides use gerrymandering, but the Republicans are using it more now. Uh, yes. What's another question? I'm going to see if I can find that that article in the Washington Post. Yes. Um, I just don't hear anything. Uh, my connection is not stable anymore. I think it's okay. better now. Okay. Can you hear me um, now? But what can one do again? Uh, what can? Yeah. Now it's 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 all right again. What can uh, can one do against gerrymandering? What kind of strategies are working against this? What can people do? Let's go back to that. Let's go back to that uh, um, scenario of, of Vienna, which has 100 black people. One of the things that you can do is to get the black people to move out of Vienna into the suburbs, <laughs> which mixes the population and makes it more difficult to gerrymander. Uh, but then, you know, but that, but that, and that carries its own set of challenges. But, 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 uh, what people can do individually is that they can get involved in organizations in political organizations to try to stop gerrymandering or they got they they if they have a particular candidate that they support who does not uh, who who rejects gerrymandering to support that candidate to work for that candidate or to work for um uh, or, or to work for an organization or contribute to an organization or volunteer for an organization that that works for works on voter suppression and ending gerrymandering. Mm -hmm. Specifically, yes. Another question. Why was the race in the House of Representatives so close? Republican won about 10 seats. Which which race was that? Uh, because there's in the House. Uh, of representatives so close, the House of, Re of Representatives. Now, um, oh, the big national race. You're talking about yeah. the big national race? Yeah, okay. I think so. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Why is it so close? Uh, that's a, uh, uh, that question, uh, what that person is, is, um, is uh, 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 I think, hinting at is that in 2018, the Democrats came in and won huge numbers. And then they lost significant numbers in 2020. Uh, they, they still control the House of Representatives, but they lost a lot of numbers. I think I think that the reason why they lost, the why Democrats lost so many numbers, and why it was so close, is that there are some districts, there are some areas around this around the the, the, the United States that uh, that hover that are both Democrat and Republican, and it really depends at that point on how people were dealing with coronavirus. Really, really, it, it did. Uh, if you supported Donald Trump and you, and you believed and you were a small business owner 
and you thought that all of the lockdowns and the quarantines were hurting your business, you were likely to vote against the Democratic representative. You were likely to, to try to increase support for the Republicans. However, if you were a person who could work at home and you were a loyal Democrat and you were uh, wearing your mask and so forth, we were talking about that earlier, you were more likely to vote for a Democratic candidate. But, but what happened is that the number, the, the level of frustration that people had with Democrats and even though, even though it was Donald Trump and his administration that was running the coronavirus, uh, 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 running it, meaning even though they were supposed to be taking care of it, a lot of people vented their anger at their local Democratic governors and representatives. And that's how the House of Representatives became so close. Um, so specifically, what's a, what's a specific example? Michigan, the, the governor of Michigan is Gretchen Whitmer. She's a loyal Democrat. And she was the one who, who issued a great many lockdown orders. But Michigan is also uh, heavily Republican, or at least has a, has, a, has a large number of Republican voters. And those people got so angry at her as a Democrat that they voted for, that they voted against the Democratic candidates and voted for the Republican candidates. I see. Mm -hmm. um, you spoke um, um, about uh, James Gaber and Stacey Abrams and the voters of Georgia as very pragmatic that uh -huh. they devoted for Joe Biden and not for Bernie Sanders. Um, what I wanted to ask you now is, what do you think would be politics in favor of the African-American people in the USA? Well, what kind of pragmatism is it that, uh, what, what should be done and what would really help uh, African-American people? Or what I don't really understand is if the black communities are heterogeneous in a way that there is not one single thing that can help all the people, but they have to do very different things to make it better. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, the most pragmatic thing that is that uh, affects African American voters right now is income and income inequality. Mm -hmm. uh, you and when I say that The primary candidate that people go to who speaks entirely about income inequality is Bernie Sanders, you would think that African Americans would support Bernie Sanders and there was a growing number of African Americans who did support Bernie Sanders. They were younger, they were independent voters. But Bernie Sanders wasn't going to win. I mean, yeah, we can talk about why, but he wasn't going to win. Why? And why wasn't he going to win? Because why people were like, I'm sorry. all right, <laughs> because because he because he was identified as a socialist, and in the United States, that's considered, you know, that's one step above a communist. And uh, Bernie Sanders may have gotten the black vote, but he wasn't going to get enough white votes. Remember, Donald Trump got 74 million white people voting for him, mostly. Mm -hmm. Those people were not going to vote for, him, for Bernie Sanders. They just weren't. Um, and my candidate, my chosen candidate was Elizabeth Warren. I thought she would have been great. Uh, she's a and by the way, she's a former Republican who got into, I mean, identified Republican from Oklahoma, got into politics and changed her party affiliation and now is one of the most uh, recognizable members of the Progressive Party. She wasn't going to win either. So African Americans looked at, really looked at, well, who is going to win? And unfortunately, a, an, an older white male, uh, a Catholic white male, was much more likely to win than a white woman or a, uh, a white Jewish man. It just, it just, he wasn't going to win. Bernie Sanders wasn't going to win. And apart from uh, the things about income, what uh, pragmatic things would be uh, important to do? Uh, for for uh, many African Americans, uh, work at minimum wage jobs. And there's been a lot of uh, discussion about this really in the last four or five years, really. But uh, minimum wage right now, I think is I, I'm gonna get I'm gonna it's it's about eight dollars an hour. It's not eight dollars. It's like seven dollars and seventy five cents. And if you do the math, if you work forty hours a week 
and so may however many hours per month. Uh, 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 working at $8 an hour, you are under the poverty level. Joe Biden and Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren, they want to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. Uh, Joe Biden was able to do that. That's a, that's a pragmatic, uh, that's a, that is something that people can understand. If you earn twice as much, you'll be able to get out of poverty. So income inequality, poverty, uh, 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 poverty reduction is, is, a, is a huge part of, the, of pragmatic politics. Um, uh, African-American interactions with the police, uh, that needs to be addressed. Uh, 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 because the police in the United States have a great deal of power, uh, the police uh, uh, the police have a great deal of power, and and African Americans I really want to talk about ways in which uh, policing can be reformed so that so that people don't feel so anxious when they encounter the police or uh, and so forth. Uh, that's another pragmatic issue. Um, so uh, yeah, another pragmatic issue would be the environment. I know it sounds it's not it's climate change, and I know that that sounds big, but uh, but many African Americans live in cities that are that that are that that might be underwater in and by by the end of the century. Cities like Miami, cities like New Orleans, where I used to live, cities like uh, Houston, Texas, uh, uh, and many African Americans are wondering, what are you going to do? What is the president? What is what is our poli political system? going to do to reduce uh, or stop uh, this uh, climate change. Uh, very pragmatic issue, I, I, I've left it out, and I'm sorry that I left it out, is how are you going to deal with coronavirus? Uh, um, mm -hmm. One of the things that very specifically affects African Americans uh, and people of color uh, is the coronavirus. Um, uh, if you work in the service industry, Again, if you work in the hotels, or you're a grocery worker, or you work for Uber, um, and you're African American for a long, long time, you, you got nothing from the government. You got nothing. Nothing meaning no protection, no no uh, mandate to wear the mask, no money, and and um, and the Trump administration eventually got around to it. But African Americans, the numbers are the numbers are that African Americans. Um, uh, uh, Thirty percent of African Americans know somebody who has died from the coronavirus, and I'm one of them. I know five people who died from it. Uh, whereas ten percent, about ten percent of whites know, know someone who's died from it, and that accounts for why there's such a difference. African Americans want the government to do something because they know somebody who's died from it. Uh, whereas many whites voting for Donald Trump don't know anybody who's died from it and haven't seen it close, uh, ha ha haven't seen it happen to them uh, uh, right in front of their faces. And so they don't believe it. Um, though that, that, yes, that's, a, that's quite a pragmatic issue. And do you think that the steps that Joe Biden uh, took about uh, dealing with the coronavirus is going to improve the situation for the, the African-Americans right now? I do, Because, yes. Mm -hmm. Um, yes, I'm sorry to break, to break in, but uh, let's do a compare and contrast. Three months ago, if you remember, if I, if I remember, maybe four months ago, when, uh, when President Trump was still president, uh, it was revealed, or the, the administration revealed that they did not have uh, enough vaccines in their, uh, in storage. They said that they bought some stuff, but then they looked at what they had in storage and all the storage was gone. And that was like a hundred million, a hundred million doses. Joe mm -hmm. Biden or the Biden administration, like last week, uh, purchased 200 million additional doses of the coronavirus vaccine. My parents were vaccinated last week. I was vaccinated last week under Donald Trump. I don't know when I would have been vaccinated. Uh, my brother, who's also a professor, he was vaccinated. My sister uh, was vaccinated. Under Joe, under Donald Trump, who knows when I when we would have been vaccinated? Who knows? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, better off than, than the, the people in the European Union, where there are only the people over 80 years who are going to be vaccinated in the next two weeks. Okay, um, well, um, we should end the discussion in five minutes, but there's another question.
question um, from somebody uh, by, by, by Slido. How you think the 2022 midterm election will play out? You think the Republican Party will be able to gain back control of the Senate? Senate, sorry. No, they won't. Um, the, the gain control of the Senate? No. Uh, the, 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 the next big round, well, I'm sorry. The next big round of elections, I think, are in 2024. But the person asked a good question. Well, don't we have an election in 2022? Um, let me see who is running in 2022. Uh, you know, the, the, the tricky thing about American politics is that uh, most, most politicians get reelected. Like if you can get to that point, um, if you can get into the, if you can get into the job, uh, you, you're most, for most politicians, you're gonna be able to keep that job. Uh, like James Clyburn who's been serving since 1993. Uh, but uh, every so often, and Donald Trump proves this, every so often uh, uh, something is thrown, there's a glitch in the system or a monkey wrench, we call it, is thrown into the system. And people who once could rely on being reelected, re-elected, uh, now think, oh my goodness, I might be unseated. And that's what we call uh, a primary vote. A primary vote is, uh, so many Republican politicians are afraid of being what we call primaried. And that means that they are conservative, but another person who's running is even more conservative. And their fear is that that super conservative Donald Trump voter is going to become, uh, 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 is going to become the candidate and push people out uh, and lose that, that election. So yes, that is likely, that is possible. But I believe that no, uh, I believe that this election uh, in 2020 really Help to shape things. I, I, I also wanted to say that, um, you know, that sigh of relief that you felt when Joe Biden was elected and you, and you think to yourself, you know, who can we thank for the election of Joe Biden? On behalf of African American voters, you're welcome. I think uh, I remember that the relief here in, in Europe was very huge too when we heard about Joe Biden winning. So yes, yeah, thank you to the African American voters. Okay, thank you very much. I think we're ending now and this was very interesting. Thank you so much, um, Frau Brown and, and our Professor Brown and Frau Brickner for um, very engaging. Right back at you. <laughs> yes, um, the role of African American voters um, was tremendous in this past election as has it been for many, many elections in the history of the United States. So thank you for giving us a little bit of historical background and sharing exactly how it all went down um, in November. Um, <clears throat> I hope everyone in really enjoyed our program tonight. Um, as I mentioned, we will be doing others this month. So um, we will be hosting a virtual um, panel discussion. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, surrounded by um, the documentary Willie, which tells the story of the first Canadian and U.S. born um, black hockey hockey player in the National Hockey League. Um, and he will be joined by the first woman um, hockey player, black woman in the National Hockey League. And this is a program that we're doing jointly with the Canadian Embassy here in Vienna. And so if you would like to screen that film, please send an email to Vienna programs at state.gov. And we will be happy to give you more information about how to view the documentary ahead of the virtual panel discussion. Ahead of the virtual panel discussion on February 23rd. And then on February 25th, um, we have Professor Mishani Frazier, who is a professor at the University of Kansas, who will be talking about youth involvement and social movements um, <clears throat> in the United States um, around Black Americans. And um, we will be doing that in, um, we will be joined by Nermina Mumik, who um, is a member of Muslim Youth Austria. And they um, have been involved in various um, similar movements um, for all types of minorities here here in Austria. So that, that should also be an exciting discussion as well. Um, so please, as I said, follow us on social media. And thank you guys so much for joining us tonight. It's been really great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you.